Welcome to online worship for Broadway and Port Colden United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Catherine, and I greet you today on the fourth Sunday in Lent, March 10th, 2024, as we continue our Lenten journey through the valley, considering where we see and witness and encounter God's foolish love towards us. So I invite you to open yourself to how God is moving and speaking to you this day. Will you join me in our call to worship? The words will be on your screen. Rejoice, God is with us. Praise be to God. God leads us into service that will offer peace and hope to others. God leads us into worship to strengthen our spirits. Come, let us worship. Praise be to God who leads us each and every day. Let us continue our time in song. Will you join me in a responsive reading? Again, the words will be on the screen and your responses are in bold. Come, let us enter the land that God has prepared for us. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. Our days of wandering in the barren desert are at an end. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. Hungry and thirsty, we cry out in deep despair. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. As in the waters of our baptism, we cross over the Jordan. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. The land is fertile and rich with good rain in season. God leads the way and makes our footsteps sure. The harvest is bountiful. We dwell in the land God has prepared for us. Our scripture today comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4. Hear now the word of God. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, 
He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One Saturday morning when we were in elementary school, my mother woke my sister and I up early to get on a charter bus and head to D.C. with other folk from United Methodist Churches in the area. At the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. I remember hearing people speak from a podium so far away as we sat on a hillside with friends. I remember there were a lot of folk gathered, different accents mingled in the air. Mostly, I remember rolling down the hill in front of the Washington Monument with my sister, a friend, and other children that we had met there. 
It wasn't until I was older that I learned we had been there for an event called Stand for Children. Conceived by Marion Wright Edelman, president of the Children's Defense Fund, Stand for Children was a way to demonstrate concern for the 69 million Americans under the age of 18 at that time. It ended up being the largest demonstration for children in U.S. history, where over 300,000 people met at the Lincoln Memorial to rally for the rights of the youngest among us spanning age and gender and religion, folk gathered. This event is one of many that has shaped how I take action around confronting injustice that I encounter. Injustice is a tricky phrase because in our society, injustice is commonly defined as either the absence or the opposite of justice. Yet what we consider just as a society changes as the world grows and changes. What has been a common thread throughout history is that when a group with wealth and power or authority give preferential treatment to one group in the making of laws and establishing social boundaries, injustice occurs. And throughout history, confronting injustice means, at its core, confronting the systems of power that impact our day-to-day. In an article from Christian publication Outreach Magazine, a journalist posed this question in 2020. When is it okay to break the law? This journalist continued on to say this. A few historical examples show that the law is a blunt instrument at best, and sometimes a very poor moral guide. Think of the things that historically we have decided as a society were perfectly cool and legit. Slavery was lawful. The Holocaust was legal. Segregation was legally sanctioned. Apartheid was hunky-dory, yet all were plainly wrong. Historically, the most terrible things, war, genocide, and slavery, have resulted not from disobedience, but from obedience. Simply put, the law does not dictate our ethics. God does. The law does not dictate our ethics. God does. The season of Lent, this journey that we are on together, invites us to consider what things in our life are limiting our God-given potential, living fully into who God has called and created us to be. In these weeks, these six weeks, we are invited to take time to consider what are the things that stand between us and God, the things that stand between us and our neighbors, between us and life, the life of the spirit. It is meant to be a time of wrestling and questioning so that we become those who live more fully into the community God has called us to be. And so this is a heavy burden a heavy burden to carry alone, to have eyes wide open, to see the pain, the need, the lack that dwells among us. Yet God has called us to confront these things that we witness together, knowing that our many gifts and many talents brought together can change everything for good. In our scripture today, we witness an honest, open, and very public lament of an injustice that is based on prejudice and hatred. The book of Esther is a absolutely wild ride in 10 chapters. The story begins when the king of Persia throws two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days, all for the purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. 
on the last day of this feast, the king is drunk, so drunk that he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses. And in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes a silly decree that all Persian men should be the master of their own homes. And some scholars uh, allude to the fact that not only was she kicked out from being queen, but that she may have been killed as well. But then to add insult to injury, the king holds a beauty pageant throughout the land to find a new queen. Esther, a Jewish orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai, is chosen to be among those for her beauty. Eventually, after a process, she becomes queen, but keeps her Jewish identity a secret. Haman, an arrogant official, is promoted by the king and expects everyone to bow to him just because of the power he has been given. Mordecai encounters him and refuses to do just that, sparking Haman's desire for revenge. Revenge not only against Mordecai, but against all the Jews in the kingdom. Filled with this absolute rage, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact a decree to destroy all of the Jews. Mordecai learns of Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews and responds with deep mourning. He goes to the king's inner court, tearing his clothes, wearing sackcloth and ashes, a traditional sign of grief. But Mordecai's sorrow is not solitary. This news has spread throughout the land and many Jews throughout the Persian Empire begin to mourn and weep when they learn of this decree. This collective expression of grief symbolizes solidarity and unity among the community as they face the imminent threat of destruction together. But it doesn't end there. Throughout these first chapters, first four chapters, because that's only as far as we've gotten to get to our reading today, themes of power and obedience and courage emerge setting the stage for Esther's eventual intervention to save her people. Esther is a curious book uh, in the Bible because God is never mentioned in it. The story is framed in such a way that it is full of odd coincidences and ironic reversals that force you as the reader to see God's purposes at work behind every scene in all ten, 10 chapters. The book, to be read in full, becomes an invitation to read the story looking for God's activity. And when you do it, there are signs of it everywhere. And so we get to our passage from today. Esther is initially hesitant to intervene due to the risks involved. Her first response when hearing about Mordecai's lament is to send him a change of clothing, which he refuses. Yet she is not angry or bitter by his refusal. She doesn't demand he end his mourning altogether either. Esther changes tactics. She sends a trusted servant to find out what was going on. Her persistence allowed for lament to turn into action. Because Mordecai charges her with these words, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so the account continues, moved by Mordecai's proof of Haman's plot, Esther recognizes the gravity of the situation for everyone. Unsure of what she can do, she realizes the importance of unity and the power of community. And so she requests that all the Jews in Susa fast and pray for her as she prepares to approach the king. What we witness is Esther's intentional response in the midst of communal lament that leads her to approach the king in a way where he actually hears her request. 
while reversing the decree is impossible. A plan, because of this intentionality, is set into motion that leads to the death of Haman, but also to the survival of the Jewish people. Grief and prayer for informed action. Like Mordecai and Esther, we too can cry out together against injustice, whether it's through protest or advocacy or supporting marginalized communities. In our own lives, though, when we witness or experience injustice, it's essential to respond with both words and actions. Through collective action, through collective solidarity, we can move closer to realizing God's vision for humanity, a vision of justice and compassion and equality. So beloved, I wonder, how are we, each of us, called to persist alongside others in the face of injustice? Exploring different options and actions when the first or second or third thing doesn't work out. How are we called to persist alongside others? Hmm. Today, over 25 years after that rally I attended, Stand for Children is an organization working across nine states whose mission is to ensure all students a high quality, relevant education, especially those whose boundless potential is overlooked and undertapped because of their skin color, zip code, first language, or disability. Stand for Children has a list of more than 200 state and local legislative and policy victories that demonstrate the power of grassroots efforts to improve the lives of students, families, and educators. They have leveraged in these 25 plus years over $6.7 billion in education investments and they note that policies invest and investments that Stand for Children has secured are improving the lives of more than 5.6 million children. Often, we jumped to action in an attempt to fix the perceived problem. We don't do the work to understand the impacts of context and history and to create effective and lasting change. We don't do the intentional work to sit and understand. Yet this story, this story of Esther shows us that lament can eventually lead us to righteous action if we let it. As United Methodists, one of the things that guides our communal work is the social principles. The social principles originally uh, started in the early 1900s and edited uh, every four years at General Conference are not to be considered church law. The social principles are a prayerful and thoughtful effort on the part of the General Conference to speak to the human issues in the contemporary world from a sound biblical and theological foundation, as historically demonstrated in United Methodist traditions. These principles are a call to faithfulness and are intended to be instructive and persuasive in the best of the prophetic spirit for such a time as this. The social principles are a call to all members of the United Methodist Church to a prayerful, studied dialogue of faith and practice. The United Methodist Church says that its mission, our mission, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's the why of everything we do. Whatever we do, we preach, we teach, we do music, maintain buildings, go to committee me meetings, feed people, learn more deeply what it means to follow Jesus. All that we do, we do it not to appease an angry God or to assure ourselves of a secure and blissful afterlife. We do it so that the whole world might be transformed 
changed into a place that reflects the visible, generous, inclusive, reconciling love of God. This, my friends, is who we are. And so today, as we sit in the midst of lament and community, I offer you these words of the creed of the United Methodist Church, a social creed. And I invite you to make space and time to sit with them this week as you continue on your Lenten journey and continue considering where God and what God is calling you to. Hear now these words. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts, and we repent of our sin in misusing these gifts to idolatrous ends. We affirm the natural world as God's handiwork and dedicate ourselves to its preservation, enhancement, and faithful use by humankind. We joyfully receive for ourselves and others the blessings of community, sexuality, marriage, and the family. We commit ourselves to the rights of men, women, children, youth, young adults, the aging, and people with disabilities to improvement of the quality of life and to the rights and dignity of all persons. We believe in the right and duty of persons to work for the glory of God and the good of themselves and others, and in the protection of their welfare in so doing, in the rights to property as a trust from God, collective bargaining and responsible consumption, and in the elimination of economic and social distress. We dedicate ourselves to peace throughout the world to the rule of justice and law among nations, and to individual freedom for all people of the world. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs and gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Amen.
what the story of Esther challenges us to uh, this day is can we move forward in the midst of our lament? Can we move forward when things have been revealed to us about behaviors that need to change in our lives? Can we move forward when we have been placed in uncomfortable places that push us out of our comfort zones? Can we move forward? The answer is yes. But the answer is also that we do not move forward alone. We move forward together in collective power, in collective trust. We become a community of empathy that holds the weight for one another so it doesn't become heavy enough to overpower. As you go into this day and into this week and into this world, may you know that your gifts, your talents, your graces, your power is needed in this world. So may you join together with others to change, to challenge, to transform for the good of all of creation. So may you hold on to that promise boldly that God goes with you in all that you do. Amen.